Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about catching up with Karnaki. That's Karnaki Mishra, who lives in Varanasi and who has um, views and opinions and reports to make to us about the U.S. and about global affairs from Varanasi, India. Good to yeah. see you again. Yeah, the last time was several years ago. You look older, what can I say? But the same, you look the same. In any event, uh, let's catch up. So the last time we spoke, we were in uh, COVID, and you were having a lot of trouble in COVID. You lost some members of your family in COVID. You were in, in school. I think you were in graduate school in business. Um, bring us current. What has happened for you since then? Well, I took up the job of uh, my father after that, and I am pursuing that job currently. And I'm planning to stick to it. And that's how my life is being going on. It was tough during COVID, very tough. But things have changed. I have learned and I have grown better as a person. Ah, okay. And right now, how are you spending your time? And currently, I am working, talking to you right now. And, and I'm planning to do some, uh, on this weekend, watching some movies, basically. <laughs> so are you going to be coming to the U.S. very soon? Are you going to be coming to Hawaii? Uh, I don't know, Jay. I don't <laughs> know. I can't say for sure, but someday I would like to visit to Hawaii. Great place. I have seen these amazing videos on Discovery. Amazing place. But where is Varanasi? Tell us more about Varanasi. How big is it? What's there? What part of the country is it in? Well, Varanasi itself is in a state called Uttar Pradesh. And it is like you have holy cities to Christians, Jerusalem, to Islam, it is Mecca. And for Hindus, it is Varanasi, very holy. It's, it's the holiest city for the Indians and the Hindus specifically. So from the point of view of culture, and history, it is almost 2,000 years old, which can be traced in past, but it can go older than that. So you can call it the oldest city in existence in India right now. And in past as well, you can imagine the history, how old it was. Buddha walked in this city, Jay. Buddha walked in the city of Varanasi at some point of time in history, maybe. So you can imagine how old we are. I've seen many pictures of uh, Varanasi uh, along the Ganges, and people from Varanasi go into the waters of the Ganges to, I guess, celebrate some religious purpose, um, to gather in the waters. And But I cannot imagine you in the water of the Ganges. Karnaki, do you go in the Ganges? Some day I stay away from the river. I don't know how to swim, so that's my decision. <laughs> <laughs> I have been to Gandhi's, but not for swimming. I have been multiple times for boating, for enjoying or relaxing and seeing that view of people coming to those ghats, praying, worshipping, doing their daily stuff. And it's just peaceful in the morning. And I hope someday you visit Paranasi so that you can see that yourself as well. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, you know, the things that have happened in the world. Now, I take it that India uh, has survived, not everybody, but uh, most people in India have survived the COVID, and the, the economy is back on track. In fact, um, the population is significantly greater, and so is the economy significantly greater since the last time we spoke. Can you talk about that? So basically, the COVID did make an impact on the economy. The COVID years were the, technically the worst years which I have seen and which India has seen recently. The GDP figures dropped due to the lockdowns. People were away from work and everything was negatively impacted. You can imagine that same things which are happening in the U.S. replicate them over multiple times due to population in India. So try to imagine one billion people having that problem, the problem of resources, the struggle about the jobs and at the end of the day it was difficult people fought back and now things are turning well well from the point of view of covid that we have recovered from that finally and we are moving towards a greater 
goal the the goal set by the government is to reach the 5 trillion dollar mark of the economy by the nominal gdp we are trying to achieve that by 2028 or 2029 being the third largest economy in the world yes that's definitely the news so um what about your relations with pakistan how have your relations with pakistan changed they've had floods they've had governmental you know uh, disruptions um they've had problems in pakistan but how is the relationship of india and pakistan doing these days currently pakistan is having its own issues its own political mess uh in my opinion basically totally personal pakistan is not a democracy so it's it's a military state so the military controls and the government is just for the show and right now they are not in a very good place they are having a financial crisis so to that financial crisis or due to that financial crisis they are not able to engage in multi schemes against india they are they are mess, managing their own mess complete mess utter mess a foreign reserve of only 8 or 10 billion dollars they are surviving seeking a loan from imf so i can't expect anything from pakistan in future as well if they can't manage their own mess well you know the um, the terrorists who uh, came to, into india from pakistan and and attacked the um, the hotel and other institutions in mumbai a few years ago is that still a threat no that's not a threat but terrorism uh, on its own is a very big concern for everyone not not just one nation recently we had some tussles with the terrorists in the state of jammu and kashmir our few soldiers were killed or, and we fought back we tried to kill those and neutralize those terrorists we are trying to make that area peaceful open to public and safe for everyone and terrorism is a big problem for that we are trying to solve that issue of terrorism uh and the best way to solve terrorism is to fight terrorism a few years ago there was a lot of news about women who were being attacked on buses raped murdered on buses in india and you know there was a certain outcry against that um because mm. that is is really not consistent with uh, you know indian values um and i wonder if that's um still happening i wonder if if uh, that that particular phenomenon is still going on or or has it been stopped well things look crime is a more of a social issue it's like asking that uh, can murders ever be stopped so it's just like that things uh, people are much more aware i can say surely for that they are more aware about their rights and they are more about actions if they see any injustice people take action so that has changed the outlook has changed people are more positive and these crimes are there the the problem is uh, the the severe crimes are reported sometimes and we stay silent or people don't know about the crimes which which are petty and we overlook as society so crimes i believe rapes murders and anything like that societal issue no matter how much you try you can try to resolve it try to reduce it but if you say you can end the crimes or murders or rapes in a country that, that's not possible it's it's a huge task uh yeah. things have resolved but, but we are trying to do better on the rights of women and the treatment of women there is a very interesting movie playing on cable in the US called Maharaj and it uh, speaks of a time in India in a um, in a rural area i guess i'm not sure where uh where the maharaja had first rights on any woman who was about to be married um it, this is similar to first rights that god is seen you in french uh that that was going on at roughly the same time in europe um but the movie you know uh shows that the local people uh led by a guy named khan who was the actor is khan 
and Khan is the son of a very famous actor in India. Um, yes. He, uh, this character in what is apparently a documentary of sorts, um, took the matter to the public and he created a newspaper and he wrote about this practice of taking first rights on women who were about to be married. And he, he uh, wound up in a trial with the Maharaja and he won the case. The trial was about defamation. The Maharaja said, you can't say that about me. And the court, which at the time, this is 1850 or so, um, the court was largely British at the time. And they, they found, uh, with, with lots of support from the local people, they found that there was no defamation because the newspaper was accurately reporting what the Maharaja was doing. I wonder if you've seen the movie. If you haven't, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, called Maharaj. Um, and second, um, what, what, how, does that ring true for you? Is that something that's well known about the right, the first refusal? Mm, well, say that's a movie on Netflix and I have yet not seen it. it it's, it's on my watch list. And uh, look, Jay, the rights of women as basically from the past to what they have been now are completely different. I can't imagine 1800s. Things are not as true as movie. Let me clarify that. The movie is a fictional world, but the fictional world takes inspiration from reality. Women did have challenged in past, and it was worse. Uh, you must have known Sati. We changed that. We changed that. That uh, that, that was a tradition in past because uh, some people, old mindset, tried to burn the wife alive. But we changed. Raja Ram Mohan Roy was one such person. The widows were not allowed to remarry. We changed that too. So progress is the part of the growth. As society, as people, we learn that, like you have your own civil rights movement, that discrimination is not the thing. You can't carry on with that. In 1960s, you must have seen that or you must have read about it in the US. So things and transformations took place people became more aware about their rights, and, and we completely changed that. Not just under the British rule, but in the rule of the Indian government as well. We have taken strict actions against such uh, horrendous ideas and practices. Um, and these are not the reality of 21st century's India. We do have problems, but we try to solve them. Not like the past where things were like that. I can't imagine that. <laughs> You know, I say one thing, Bollywood has changed. You know, the quality of this movie, the approach of this movie, the, you know, um, I guess you'd call the documentary element of this movie uh, shows you that Bollywood is no longer the Bollywood we saw a few years ago, um, which were very good films. But this film is serious. And this film, you know, shows you the, the production quality, the acting quality, uh, the plot quality, it's its really very good. And although there's a, a few dance scenes, because you can't have a Bollywood movie without dance scenes. <laughs> 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 the dance scenes are limited, and, and the movie is really not about dancing. <laughs> yes, certainly. If you want a list of movies, I can surely suggest you some, because there are a lot of movies without dance numbers as well. And they are excellent. And they are excellent. <laughs> OK, I want to talk about geopolitics for a minute, Kartiki. Uh, let's talk about China first. You know, China and India uh, have had um, battles without weapons up there in the mountains in the Himalayas uh, for years mm -hmm. uh, because of the border is a kind of amorphous. And nobody really knows where the border is. And so they go up there in the, in the, in the Himalayas and fight with sticks. They fight with sticks, and they're still doing that, which I find remarkable. Now, that's not a full statement of the relationship between India uh, and China. Can you tell me how the relationship between India and China has evolved in the last couple of years? What you are talking about, the fight with sticks, was a thing, a tussle with the Chinese in 2020. We had a border skirmish with the Chinese. 
we lost soldiers and China lost soldiers too. India and China have a basic agreement that we, we won't carry weapons to the borders, not lethal weapons like guns, so that any fight which takes place is limited with violence of uh, a kind. Because gun takes the violence to the whole new level. It, it can erupt a war. So to avoid that, we have a basic understanding that even on border, if things are like that, we will stick to this plan, actual sticks. <laughs> so that's the thing. And due to that, things became very tensed with the Chinese. From 2020 to 2024, that has been a major issue. We are on a currently standoff with the Chinese, eyeball to eyeball on the Himalayan borders. And actually, I think the, the, the problem with the Chinese is that they are very expansionist. Anything which can they claim, they call it theirs, like the South China Sea. So that's the thing with the Chinese on the borders in Himalayas. Yes. Due to the border, where it is, which is not defined, this creates a big problem because we can't say if this is your side or my side. And this confusion gives the Chinese the confidence to take some actions which are not permissible by international law. It's complete violation of those stuff. So the Chinese are a problem. And even if with all that happening on borders, we have a trade with the Chinese of $118 billion. And China is our largest trading partner. And the second is US, followed by 117 or something like that. But you can see the nature. There are fights on the border, but there is trade as well. And that trade is uh, is very bad for India because we are having a trade deficit of $80 billion or more. And that's very bad. You can imagine a trade deficit of $80 billion. We are not exporting much, or I should say they are not taking much from India. Instead, we are importing more. So that's a challenge. Trade is happening, and China is a problem, very big problem. And it will become a problem in future for everyone else too. And India understands that. You have to fight China someday in future. Take my words. Maybe over Taiwan or maybe over Philippines, but US will be fighting sometime in future with the Chinese. I see that happening. The Himalayas are only, what, 300 kilometers from Varanasi? More, maybe more, maybe more. Maybe not, maybe. not too much more. Not too much more, maybe maybe 400, 700 or 600. Mm. Yes, if you if you put that into it. Mm. Yeah, China is very aggressive these days. Certainly, we know that it's aggressive uh, in Hong Kong. It's aggressive toward Taiwan. It's aggressive in the uh, you know South China Sea with the Philippines. Um, so, does that trouble people in India? Just exactly how aggressive China is and how it likes to pick up additional territory. Uh, and wants to be the hegemon of, of the whole Pacific area. Um, how, do, how do you feel about that? How do your friends and colleagues feel about that? Well, no one is positive about China, that's for sure. We understand that we trade with China, but if you speak in political terms, every single person in India is aware that China is a threat. The, not the threat just politically, but on, on the terms of war as well. We fought an actual war in 1960s. You, U.S. must have not fought a war with the Chinese, but we did. We actually did fight a war with the Chinese in 1960s. So historically speaking, since the communist state took the power in the China in 1940s, till now, things have been in strain. And we understand that China is a hegemon, and it dis doesn't respect the international law as you expect. And that's why we built for US, Japan, Australia, working together to contain China. Ford is not a military alliance, but the idea is very same. Stop the expansionist Chinese policies in South China Sea. That's the aim. And, yeah. and the next, next target is Taiwan. And I sure that they will attack Taiwan in future once they have prepared. They are learning from the Russians that what happened in Ukraine, they will take the lessons and they will attack Taiwan and you must, US must prepare for it. 
if if not somehow but that's going to happen i can't predict future but i can definitely see the signs that chinese are preparing for something big no it's so interesting you know china is so aggressive and it always wants more it wants to expand it wants to you know do belt road and all that all across the world but india is not like that India is the opposite of, am I right? It's the opposite of all of that. Uh, democracy, um, there's a certain modesty in its foreign policy. Um, it, it really doesn't want to be a hegemon, even though in some ways it is. Um, and it doesn't want to be aggressive in trying to take territory. India is the opposite, isn't it? Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true, Zoom. Because we are a democracy, try to understand. They are basically a dictatorship. We are a democracy, and as a democracy, we have learned that in politics, only one thing works, diplomacy. You can't win nations by wars. That's not going to happen. Even if you have a territorial victory, it will have political consequences. That's what's happening with Ukraine right now. They are losing territory, and they are not going to take it back. I understand that. But the political defeat is of Russia. Because they are being isolated, they are being cornered, they have been sanctioned. And even my prime minister went on a visit to Russia in, on 9th of July and 8th of July and said to the face of prime, uh, President Putin that war is not a solution. Diplomacy is the way out to this. Well, that's what uh, Narendra Modi has said maybe a hundred times, war is not the solution, it's only peace. But what he really means by that is uh, he wants Russia to prevail. He wants, uh, he wants Russia to take Ukraine. He wants Ukraine to be beaten, surrender, what have you. He is on Putin's side. It's very clear from his trip to Moscow recently. It's very clear from the photos that came back from that trip, the statements he made. He is completely supporting Putin and that war. Is that consistent with the Indian sensibility? It's an aggression war. Well, I understand that. Look, the first aggression which took was against Ukraine. Russia was the invading force. That's clear. But the thing is, it's politics, game. it's diplomacy. India needs cheap Russian oil, it is a need because we are driving a huge economy and a cheap oil is much needed. Second thing is defense. 65% of our uh, defense capabilities and understanding are with the Russians. We are purchasing the spare parts, the weapons. So, to keep that balance, because we need Russians and we are trading with the Russians, talking with the Russians, that they don't finally sit on the China's lap. If India moves out of that equation, Russia will be totally dependent on China, and you don't want that. Because if a, a China, a Russia dependent is on China, they can uh, be a vassal state. And you don't want a Russia to become a vassal state of the Chinese, because that will be a huge problem. So to Take that diplomacy into account. India does that. It's a balancing act. I understand it. From the Western point of view, it's problematic, but it's a balancing act, which is much needed. Because if India is not there, try to imagine Russia totally dependent on China without having any sensible advice like partners from India. Try to imagine that for a second. North Korea and China. And there is one sensible nation, India, saying that Russia should not take stupid actions. If India moves out of that equation, think what Russia can do. Yes. And so it's a very practical thing that Modi is doing. And it's probably uh, in India's best interest. But, you know, it, it just seems so opposite from India's true sensibilities. Indian people are kind, they're caring, they're democratic, and they have a whole culture of being kind and caring. I know there are exceptions to that, but but to support a guy who is a war criminal, to support a guy who kidnaps children, does rape and torture and all kinds of other war crimes, um, just doesn't seem consistent with you know India's moral fiber. Um, and I, I guess I understand Modi is in a balancing act and he's trying 
to stay in the right place. Not easy these days. But what does the guy on the street think? What do you think in your heart? If you don't want to tell me, it's okay. Uh, what do your friends and colleagues think? Do they like this, supporting a monster this way? Look, look, you, you took a very good question into account. So the perception, what you said about this war, the local people or the people or my colleagues, their opinion is that uh, this war, the premise of this war was Ukraine joining the NATO. And Russia wanted Ukraine not to join the NATO because that would bring NATO forces on the Russian border. Ukraine joining NATO would have been a political threat uh, or diplomatic threat or threat to the Rus Russian security. So this was the reason that Russia invaded Ukraine, as, as we can see politically uh, from the point of view of this war. And US said that they will back Ukraine into the NATO. And that didn't happen. Russia attacked Ukraine. U.S. didn't let the Ukrainians join the NATO. And this was the thing. Ukrainians brought this war onto themselves. Just because U.S. promised them to join NATO, they went totally against Russians. And Russia took that opportunity. I would say misused that opportunity as the premise of security threat and attack uh, Ukraine. That, that was totally wrong. I understand it. But the thing is that the promise of joining to the NATO was something which led to this war, uh, which which I technically understand. And that's the local understanding of the people as well. This war is not between um, Ukraine or Russia. This war is between West and the Russians. The political interest of West and the political interest of Russians. And this is the tussle about war. Uh, this Ukraine becomes, a, 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 you can say, a battlefield, a testing ground for that war. And that's happening to the Ukrainian people. They, they, are, they, are, they are like a cannon fodder to stop the Russians. So that's politics. It's bad, but it's politics. I, I understand it. So it's very bad, but that's how the real politics work in the international scene. And I understand the history of it. I understand that the U.S. was not particularly uh, helpful to you in the early 70s with the Seventh Fleet out there. Um, that was that was trouble, and that cast a long shower, uh, shadow on India-U.S. relations. But since then, you know, things have changed, and it seems to me that India is is connected at the hip with the U.S. Um, you know, it's connected at the hip with Western Europe too. But the U.S. has has um, a, a, a tremendous connection with India. There's so many Indian people. They occupy positions. You must see this in the news all the time. They occupy positions of power and influence here every day. They they are the CEOs of major global corporations that that are headquartered in the U.S. Um, we have the real possibility of an Indian woman becoming the president of the United States, Kardeki, the president of the United States. Uh, they didn't do even that well in Britain, you know. Um, this is quite a remarkable moment for the relationship of the U.S. and India. Um, I mean, I, uh, so many people we know, so many people on think tech that we know are Indian and American, and, um, you know, they talk about this. So I guess... I guess, um, you know, what I see, and I like your view of it, is this is pretty risky business because you have a, an emotional Congress, um, an emotional Congress that doesn't like Putin. And uh, some people support Trump. Trump likes Putin. The whole thing is a bit of confusion these days. But, but most of the people I know don't like Putin. They don't like this war. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I fear that uh, Modi's position, his balancing act in dealing with um, with Putin, perhaps goes too far. I mean, he's he's hugging Putin, he's swearing support to Putin, he's making mutual defense agreements with Putin. Um, what does he expect the U.S. is going to do about that? Does he expect that's going to improve the relationship of Modi and the Indian government? With the United States, isn't he taking a risk here? Mm, very good question, Dave. 
first thing let me clarify that india and russia don't have any mutual defense agreement like they do because that article 5 thing we don't have anything with, like that sorts with russia the second thing is that uh, russia has been a partner since 1940s you you said yourself that you have the seventh fleet at our doors in 1970s and that pushed india to russia we we were pushed to russia just because us wasn't there to support us and russia was in during those times so it's it's more like uh, a relationship of stability from 1940s till uh, till now in 2024 the russian and india relations are quite stable if you compare it to the any other political relations or the diplomatic relations around the world so to the my understanding of this whole situation is that india understands that russia is crucial and to have russians on the talking table you need diplomacy you had a nato summit when putin prime minister modi was in russia and you had a nato summit i am sure about that uh, currently taking place along the sides so the thing was in the in the talks with the russians we did bring this point that stop this war it is much needed and the us must understand that to stop the war in ukraine you need to talk to russia because this war is not going to stop until and unless russia is on the table with you you need ukraine russia on the table for the talks to stop this thing so to have this diplomacy to have these talks i personally believe uh us to, uh, should take a different approach because uh, uh, this war is too difficult too long and too stuff too much suffering for the world as well i, I have seen those videos of russia bombing the hospital to the children and i understand my my, my great concern to the ukrainians and i'm sorry for that but i need to understand and uh, people need to understand that diplomacy is the only way and fighting the war with the russians will take decades i don't know but that's that's not possible that russia is being defeated in this war this war is on a status quo nothing changing much russia is in push back russia is in occupying territories they are fighting and as far as i know as i know trump may win the elections zelensky is trying to have some negotiations with putin seeing that on the brink if trump becomes president the war with the russians will be compromised uh, i understand that we know that uh, uh, narendra modi is um he wants to agree with putin for lots of geopolitical and practical reasons but and so he in many ways is listening to putin accepting putin's view of the world but is is he influential with putin Does Putin listen to him? If he says to Putin, "I think you should do this and that," would Putin do those things or just blow him off? Well, Jay, uh, the thing was when Ukraine war of uh, 2020s was it was on the edge. It was starting. Uh, Russia had plans to use nu- nukes on Ukraine. India and China convinced Russia not to do something stupid. you can imagine stopping russia to stop uh, to not to use the nukes russia might have used nukes but india influenced that decision and it is by the state department of the us us had this understanding that india and china are playing with russia not to use those nukes because if russia would have done that this war would have been gone in some other direction maybe a third world war to have that diplomatic influence that where you can say behind the back door channels that hey don't do something stupid because that will bring you consequences that you can't imagine and that's what diplomacy is you need nations like india because if you are not talking to russia you need someone trustable like india you us is india's friend and you need someone like us to talk with the russian say hey, don't do something stupid don't tax stupid don't use the nuclear weapons and that's why you need india nations like him is um narendra modi popular you know he he was more popular before it seems like he's less popular but still he won that election 
Uh, so question, you know, uh, are people behind him in this? Are the Indian people support his way of doing things uh, with Russia? Well, more or less, uh, it is the government thing, and people are with the government. Uh, look, the government's stand is what people take, because we have seen Mr. Jaishankar, our foreign minister, talking to the Western world about the Russian oil, because it is much needed. So the whole understanding of this Russia-Ukraine conflict is that this needs to be stopped, and to stop this war, diplomacy is the best thing. And people agree with that. And when Prime Minister Modi comes into account, why he is important? Because the last time a Prime Minister who was elected third time in a row was Prime Minister Nehru in 1940s. He was the first Prime Minister of India. And 60 years have passed, and Narendra Modi is the only Prime Minister after Jawaharlal Nehru to achieve a victory in a national election for the third time in a row. It's a very rare thing in Indian politics. No prime minister has uh, three terms consecutively or has won three terms consecutively. It is only Prime Minister Modi who has won three, uh, three elections consecutively, one after the other, 2014, 2019, and 2024. It is super rare. It's, it, it's very rare to see someone like, like him in power again because you can't expect a third term. It's it's a super rare third term. So you can say he is very popular. Yes, his popularity has reduced, his majority has reduced, but he stays popular right now. Last question, Karthiki, is uh, is the U.S. Okay, and I mentioned that the U.S. has a, an enormous and influential Indian population. I mean, first generation Indian, second generation Indian, lots of Indian. And in fact, um, you know, uh, we have we have a, a, a candidate for the presidency. So, and she might she might win. Kamala Harris may be president, an Indian president. Um, and on the other hand, we have Trump running against him. So, I'm wondering how you and the people that you you know deal with, your friends and colleagues, feel about those two candidates. Um, would you favor Trump? Last time we spoke, you said you thought. Uh, that he was um, powerful and therefore attractive. Um, but the circumstances have changed. He's been convicted of uh, felonies, um, 34 of them. He's um, He's been lucky in court, but in fact, he's been charged in a number of cases. Um, he's taken outrageous positions um, uh, with regard to American issues and and also international issues. Do you still feel that he is powerful and therefore should be supported? Or would you instead support Kamala Harris? Um, this is really important to the U.S. And it's important for the U.S. to know, you know, the people in other countries who take a position on the candidates that are running. So give us your thoughts about, you know, the candidates that are running and the thoughts of the people you deal with. Very good question. The U.S. politics is quite interesting, and I have been following U.S. politics since I knew that Trump is going to be in the race again. And in past, you must have seen Trump had an assassination attempt. That's clear that someone tried to kill Trump, and that's not how things work in a functioning democracy. If U.S. is a democracy, you don't try to kill your opposition. <laughs> So even if that, that person who tried to kill must have had some political opinion, must have had some political differences, but to take those political differences to such extent that I will kill the opposition is not something right. Now coming to the question of Kamala Harris and President Trump. When this election started, the season of election started in the US, I saw the debate of President Biden and Donald Trump. And Biden messed up in that debate because due to age or maybe health, he wasn't the right candidate. See, the whole flow for the Democrats being elected was affected by that debate. Look, Jay, that debate had serious impact all over the world. Everyone knew that debate was messed up and Democrats messed up in that debate and Donald Trump had a lead. So, again, I know Kamala Harris is the choice for the president, but it is not the choice of the people from the Democrat Party. 
how many people will support her i am not sure maybe obama would be contesting his wife michelle obama maybe clinton somehow but are they willing to support her uh, her for the candidature is something different because people will ask kamala harris is not the choice we ask for it is the choice joe biden implied that she should be but is she the person who is being the candidate or the chosen candidate so that thing will happen so you can say the popular choice is not kamala harris people understand kamala harris is necessary but in the democratic party itself or the democrat party itself are they willing to choose kamala is the first question if that takes place and if she becomes finally the candidate and is accepted by all then the situation of trump and kamala harris takes place and what i can see trump has chances of winning you can't any uh, predict anything but things are quite high the emotions are quite high in us you had an assassination attempt and he will play that sympathy card he will play that i am fighting for democracy i am the president who took a bullet for democracy he will play that narrative as a politician and i know that well so it is on the people are they what they are willing to do look because both these options are not democratic kamala harris is not the choice of the people elected by the democrats and trump itself has proved himself in past that he is not the most perfect candidate so you have a very difficult choice it's much more difficult for like india between russia or us you have a situation where your country's future is dependent and what i can see right now there are chances of trump being back in white house maybe not sure but maybe he he might be back in white house carnegie does it bother you to know that i don't agree with what you're saying that's democracy jeff i understand it and i won't kill you for it <laughs> <laughs> okay we're out of time we'll have to leave it there i really appreciate you coming on carnegie i appreciate you reaching out and i appreciate your discussion as i always have thank you so much for appearing on think tech aloha